Maşallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin. Salatu ve selamu ala Resulü Kerim ve Ali. Radallahu anil muhacirin ve al-ansar ve men tab'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-din. Thumma amma ba'd. Welcome back and I will take you through a 45 minute presentation of the ideas of the Maqasid methodology but applied to your reading of the Quran. So basically when we took the course together and we, when you read the book, you read it for the general sense of the renewal of Islamic scholarship and Islamic thought and so on. But I will uh, now address what you are going to be doing as you are reading the Quran. The question of how I can read the Quran is a simple question, but it's very complex for a humble human to guide you through. Why? Because as Dr. Basma mentioned before the break, they are openings that Allah opens for you. You, you have to knock the door and wait for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to start to answer your prayers to open the ideas of the Quran for you. I'm talking about the new ideas. And to start to make links between meanings and to start to understand how some of what is said there is going to apply to your questions and your concerns. Uh, you come to the Quran though with a clean slate, like you you just come with um, a heart that that turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. Hudan lil muttaqeen. It's a guidance for those who are uh, heedful of Allah. Um, if you have problems in terms of your heart, you are going to have difficulty having that fiqh of the Qur'an that you are looking for. Because the Qur'an is huda and guidance for the believers. Huda wa rahmatan liqawmi yu'minun. It's a mercy and a guidance for the believers. And as you know, belief goes up and down. It goes up with uh, a ta'a and being faithful and doing good deeds and it goes down with doing evil deeds and therefore if you have if you have some issues that you need to work on I mean moral issues and psychological issues and so on you will need to work on them before you read the Quran this way um, it doesn't mean that you read the Quran with no faults we all have faults and we all are humans but you have to at least go beyond like the, the big problems and the big issues that you know yourself about so that you, you, you can open your heart for the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to uh, give you. Um, it is a light that when you start reading, Allah is speaking, subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you know. This is not somebody narrating that somebody said. This is Allah speaking. And therefore, the speech is coming from a very different perspective than any, any other speech. It's He is speaking, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and therefore, his, if I can say, his, his perspective, is different from anything that could be called a human perspective. I, I can't even describe the Quran as subhanAllah, Allah's perspective, because we say that he is Sami'un Basir, he hears all things and he sees all things, but we know that his hearing is not like our hearing and his vision is not like our vision. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, and his life is not our like our life. Our life is a soul in a body. Uh, he doesn't have any of that, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, his speech is not like our speech. 
And yes, we could read it in the human language that is Arabic, but it is different because of, um, of everything about it, from the choice of sounds or words or roots to the organization of words in an ayah to the sequence of the ayat to the shifts in topic and the shifts in the speech itself uh, sometimes in the middle of the of the sentence the speech changes from singular to plural sometimes in the middle of the sentence the speech changes from the akhira to the dunya and then back to the akhira it's uh, it's it's a fantastic book and uh, you really need to knock on the door as i'm saying so that allah opens for you but i have some humble recommendations to give so that you perhaps when you read you you uh, at least for the sake of this exercise inshallah you have uh, a, a, a an exercise that is fruitful inshallah um, this is the Quranic reflection program. As I mentioned, introduction. The objective is to create knowledge from from the Quran. Fiqh, uh, the real fiqh, Fiqh is an understanding. Fiqh is not just jurisprudence. Jurisprudence is a fiqh that is in the tashri'a, al fiqh al tashri'i. But fiqh, when you say just fiqh, it's not just about tashri'a or about madhahib and so on, is about, as I mentioned, like in the introduction, about architecture and medicine and psychology, about education and engineering and policy, as well as about hadith and da'wah and so on. And executed by you, you are the scholar here, and you are the reader, and uh, you are the mujtahid in that sense. And the outcome should be formative theories, guiding principles, you discover a way of dealing with a phenomena. You have a new strategy. You are restructuring something about your discipline. I'll talk about that. Please uh, ask us to read the book in Arabic or English or both. Now, we divided this course into the seven-month plan according to the division that is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu about the Sahaba reading the Quran over a week, over seven days. Uh, and in the Islamic tradition, this developed into what is called Fami Bishawq, Fatiha al Ma'ida Yunus, Bani Israel, or Isra, al Shu'ara, was Safat, and uh, then you have uh, Qaf. And, and if you look at it in terms of number of surahs, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13 and then 62 surahs. So this is how we're going to divide. So in the first session, of course, after the Fatiha, you read Al-Baqarah, Al-Imran, and Al-Nisa. So you are going to read this this week, this month, and then next month, Al-Ma'idah, Al-An'am, Al-A'raf, Al-Anfal, Al-Tawbah, and so forth. Now, the do-nots. One, do not do taqlid, which means do not open a tafsir. This is not a tafsir exercise. Tafsir is the reading of someone else and not your reading. Uh, the tafsir is what a tabari or Ibn Kathir or Ibn Ashur or Muhammad Abdu or whoever read the Quran or, or Jasir with, in my humble tafsir that I'm, I'm writing um, is, is just a scholar's view of the Quran. But you are going to have, if you wish, your own tafsir. And I'm not saying you are going to, uh, again, give fatwa like the fuqaha, or you are going to come up with something like a zamakhshari. But you are going to come up with something that if a zamakhshari is an engineer today in Canada, like some of you are, he is going to read differently. And if Ibn Kathir is one of you who is working in military sciences, 
he's going to read differently. Does this mean that tafsir is irrelevant? Of course not. It's irrelevant, but it's the history of tafsir. You see, there is a difference between the history of knowledge and knowledge. And what we want you to do is to produce knowledge for our time. Oh, but sometimes I have issues with some Arabic words. Yeah, that's when you can open a dictionary or you open a tafsir like a dictionary. Okay, what do they say about this word? But don't imprison yourself in any of the tafsir. It doesn't mean that they are wrong or any of that, but this is not the exercise we're trying to do. This will corrupt our exercise because you as someone who is working education, you are not going to find answers for your questions in Ibn Kathir because Ibn Kathir is not coming from an educational perspective. He is a theory, so he is gathering the hadith that is with the ayat and the sahaba and the tabi'i, and he has a method, and it's a very respected method. I personally learned a lot from him, but if I am in your place now in the program, I would not open Ibn Kathir or the Tabari or Zamakhshari or any of these. Now, secondly, partialism, at tajzi Always connect, please, as you read. Connect the ayat before and after. Connect the words. Why is it like that? Ask why and make the connections because of the questions of why as you read. And don't partialize. I remember when we used to memorize the Quran uh, when we were kids. I mean, the Sheikh, to test that we are really good, he starts from the middle of the ayah. And sometimes in the middle of the word, you know, you know, continue after, this, like in the middle of, of the word, he starts. So traditionally, I personally am trained to slice the Quran because, you know, I used to memorize the one page every day and this and that. And I'm, I'm used to slice. I don't want you to slice the Quran, but integrate, integrate. You stop at a word. You are an economist and you stop at the word al-mal. Oh, wow, money. Okay. Where, where else is al-mal in the Quran? We are dividing it into seven sections just for our reading. But, oh, I read something about al-mal in the previous surah. Let me go and see. Connect. Three, apologism. Don't do tabrir. Don't read capitalism in the Quran if you are an economist. Don't read Freud in the Quran if you are a psychologist. Don't read, uh, what's his name, Durkheim, if you are a social sciences guy. I mean, it, you know, Durkheim talked about the classification of people based on uh, what they claim. You know, in sociology, this is one of their bid'as. You know, you claim to be something, even gender now. You claim to be a man or woman. Yalla, you are a man or a woman. The Quran doesn't do that. So when you look at the Quran, you realize that, uh, no, the classification of parties or groups comes from outside the groups. They don't self-claim to be, uh, you know, anything, yeah, you know. We judge based on a criteria, for example. So don't apologize for the previous knowledge you have by reading it into the Quran. And then the Quran becomes all about development and democracy and human rights and international agreements and stuff. And, and that is not what the Quran is talking about. Or the Quran becomes about equality and freedom. And uh, the Quran doesn't have the word equality and doesn't have the word freedom for that matter. It doesn't mean that equality as a value is not in the, oh, that, that is now a bigger question. Now you are not being apologetic and you're trying to be authentic. So, uh, fourthly, tanaqud, contradiction. Do, do not contradict, um, for example, the aqli and naqli. You know, when you read the Quran with a mindset of the revealed versus the rational. Do not, do not look at the contradictions between that. But put the Quran higher than the aqli and the naqli. The, the Quran is hegemonic and therefore integrative. Uh, do not deconstruct in the sense that do not start from a premise of looking for um, any hegemonical power structures. Uh, for example, you know, patriarchy. 
do, do not start reading the Quran with patriarchy in mind because this is a deconstructive reading because patriarchy is about the, um, the power of men and it's not about that. It's not, neither the power of men nor the power of women and it's neither the power of the state nor the power of the commoners. It, it is different. So don't enter the Quran with a deconstructionist mind especially if you're trained in social sciences, because they will train you for this in university. Now, these are the don'ts. What are the do's? The do's is to look for those seven elements that we talked about a lot in our course. Look for the objectives. Ask why. Why is Allah saying that? And whatever question that comes to your mind, why is it like that? Um, why is this not mentioned? I mentioned equality, for example. Why why is the Quran doesn't have sawasiya or sawa'a? In fact, always have laysu sawa'a. Faddal Allahu tilka rusulu faddalna ba'dahum ala ba'd. Inna akramakum 'inda Allahi atqaqum. There is always a hierarchy. For example, why why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not just simply saying that everybody is equal? What is wrong with equality? Uh, you know, what 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 is wrong with um, intellectual property, the question that Dr. Basma asked in her previous uh, research, that it, it, like it starts with, there is no intellectual uh, intellectual property in the Quran. Uh, you expect it to, to be there. There is no democracy in the Quran. You expect it to be there. Why? Why? Why there is no democracy in the Quran? And then you could start to see what is good about democracy and what is wrong about democracy? What is good about intellectual property and what is wrong? What is good about, uh, I don't know, a bank and what is not good about a bank? And so forth. Like whatever it is that you come from, you need to ask why so that you could start to be critical. And why is your key for criticism here, for critical reading? And we mentioned in the, in the book that why has to do with the future and why it has to do with the comprehensive or the integrative. The concepts, look at the concepts. You are working with society and family and so on, as some of you are. Look at the concept of marriage versus zina, and then start to define things based on marriage versus zina. This is a concept here. Look at the concept of ilm. If you are a scholar and you have a certain definition of ilm, look at what ilm is in the Quran. Uh, look at the human as the most central concept, actually, in many of the sciences. It's not the central concept in the universe. We are not the center of the universe. The universe is not human-centric, as we mentioned in the course. But look at the concept of the human. If you are a doctor, you need the concept of the human. If you are a political scientist, if you are an economist, if you are any of these, if you're an architect, what is the human, that space that you are thinking about and placing the human in the space? What is the role of the human in the architectural theory that you come from? And start to go to some basic concepts of design in your theories so that you can critique the concepts, you can restructure basically, if you're an architect, French modernism that we are living today uh, into a different kind of architecture that uh, builds differently. And it doesn't mean to go back to history and copy the domes and the fountains and so on from Andalusia or from, you don't have to do that for modern architecture, but you also don't have to copy the French modernism. If you are a political scientist, a couple of you are, you don't have to assume that when there is doula or dawla, when there is sultan or malik, you don't have to assume a modern nation state. Um, you might have a better structure or you might critique the modern nation state in a way, but also say, well, it has an advantage this way, but it's not good this way. So if you're a political scientist, do not assume that what you are learning or what you were taught at school is the basics of your concepts. Redefine the concepts based on the Quran. When you look at values, uh, 
uh, it's very important to define morality, to define beauty, and to define the harm and the benefit. What is beneficial and what is harmful and what is beautiful and what is ugly? The Quran will restructure that for you. And the value system you have, look for that. Look for commands, uh, the do's and the don'ts in the Quran. And the do's and the don'ts in the Quran are not just for the ahkam, are not just for the rules of the haram and the wajib, but they are also for many things. The Quran is asking us to walk on earth and see the, the end of the people before us, the generations, the civilizations before us. Uh, for example, this is a command that is not necessarily falling under obligations and so on. But, but look at the commands and see how you can internalize the commands, right? Uh, the universal laws, the sunan al-ilahiyya, when Allah says, it, it, that that this recurs al-tarad al-sunan you see wa kadhalika najzi al-muhsinin and this way we deal or we reward the excellent right then there is a sunnah here there is a law that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has look at the, those laws what is the pattern the historical pattern the geographical pattern the pattern in terms of society and so on wherever you're coming from Look at the Sunan Ilahiyya and see where is the Sunnah here? What is the tradition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the law? Look at the groups. And when you look at the groups, connect them to the concepts. Because in Quran and in Islam, the groups are not disjointed from the concepts. Al-ilm wal-ulama wa tijara wa tujjar you know, al-mulk wal-muluk and so forth. Any group has to be tied to a concept. In the English language, we don't have this much. Like we, you know, we, we label a group as, I don't know, terrorists, and we don't even define terror, <laughs> easy. Or we label a group as celebrities, and we don't define that. We, we, how do you define that? And what is the concept? And does the concept have sultan? Has the concept has authority or not? And we have been corrupted, our modern societies, conceptually and group-wise, in terms of how we define the world. You know, what is right and what is wrong and what is, what is a good value? Values now are just numbers. You know, more numbers is better, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُلْ لَا يَسْتَوِ الْخَبِيثُ وَالطَّيِّبُ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَكَ كَثْرَةُ الْخَبِيثُ the good and the evil is not the same, even if the evil is many. And proofs has to do, as we mentioned in the course, with the arguments, al-hujaj. How do you argue? And what is the difference between a hujja or a proof, a burhan, versus a fallacy? And the Quran is teaching us a lot of that, fallacies, the fallacies of Pharaoh, Pharaoh, only the fallacies of Pharaoh would, would give you a whole lot of ways of constructing proofs. So look for these as you read. And know that these are not different meanings. Like, you know, don't open an Excel sheet and say, okay, this is a concept, this is an objective. Well, justice, al-adl, al-qist, al-qist is an objective and is a concept. And al-muqsitun is a group. And Al-Qist is also a law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qa'iman bil Qist. He establishes Qist. So it is a law of him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Al-Qist is a value. And Al-Qist is a command. Wa aqsitu. So it's everything. So why did you divide things then into those seven elements? It's just to open your mind to the exercise of looking at certain things because we have different inclinations. Some of us are concept-oriented, people looking for words and their meanings. And some of us are objective-oriented. You always ask why and where am I going? And some of you are commands and the do's and the don'ts mentality. Some mentalities are like that. Just tell them, uh, then it starts to make sense, but they don't philosophize the word qist by itself. And uh, some of us uh, look at groups. They are interested in human groups. 
and so forth, and some of us, and so forth. But these things are all connected and are all interlapping. And if you go back to your course or to the book and read, you will see that we'll talk about the same thing in those seven sections about these seven elements anyway. Now, next, the Maqasid methodology, as we studied it, we are going to exclude two of the steps. One, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Do not refer to the hadith in this exercise. This, this doesn't mean that the hadith is wrong or, uh, you know, I am against the sunnah or any of that. Of course not. The sunnah, uh, none of my books with, with a, a page without a hadith or two or five, you see. But the hadith is a different story. It's a different story. Do not include the hadith in your reading of the Quran th this time. Why? Because the hadith requires to situate it in the Quran. Uh, you know, Ardul uh, Hadith al Quran. I know there is a, a long debate over the, that na na narration between the Sunnah and the Shia. But it's not your issue, and it's not even my issue as a scholar. I, I go beyond that. Don't look at the hadith. Why? Because the narration is partialistic and the Quran is integrative. Yes, an ayah is a partial part of the Quran, but you cannot really take an ayah without the rest of the Quran. It's not going to be possible to do that. But people do that with the hadith all the time. They take an, an uh, hadith without looking at the rest, without even looking at the story. And especially the most popular books of hadith, they cut a lot. I have, as a scholar, I have a problem with Bukhari, especially, and Muslim, especially the, the most authentic books. I have a problem with their cutting the hadith too much. The hadith is a paragraph. Don't give me five words and call it a hadith. But there is a lot of this. And also the hadith has to do with authenticity. And not everything in the authentic collections is authentic. And the hadith has to do with the background of the narrator. Um, even if the narrator is authentic, uh, uh, Sahabi, even the Sahabi, those who are specialized in hadith, if your expertise is in hadith, a couple of you are, then yeah, look at hadith because you need to see what the Quran is saying about the Sahaba, for example, and see if the Sahabi in the ulum al-hadith is equal to the Sahabi in the Quran. Of course not. It's not, it's not the same. The Quran, they are called Buhajirin wa Ansar, and it's a different story. For example, so if you are a scholar of hadith and you're reading the Quran, yes, go back to the hadith because you need to apply the Quran to the hadith theories. But if you are a scholar of any of these uh, 25, alhamdulillah, about 30, uh, medicine and management and law and architecture and language and social studies, put the hadith on the side today and just read the Quran so that uh, we can discuss. Inshallah, I am sure that something will pop up when you start to read the Quran. Oh, but but I, I have known a hadith that actually doesn't go like that, <laughs> you know. And, and, and then we are going to get into a lot of this in the Q&A, I am sure. And inshallah, we can have a good discussion. The other point is do not include critical studies of literature or reality. That step of the other sources of knowledge, do not include that. So basically what we are doing in this exercise, my brothers and sisters, is the purpose, I will talk about that now, and then reflections on the Quran and building a framework, the concepts, the objectives, and so on, just thinking in terms of those seven elements, going to skip the critical studies of other sources, and you want to come up with formative theories and principles from the Quran. You want to say, well, I think in the Quran there is a whole line that talks about wealth this way, and therefore I am going to start to change my definition of value of wealth, because as an economist, I am learning a lesson from the Quran. Or there is a whole line that defines beauty in a particular way. And as an artist, uh, I'm not sure if any of you is, but I didn't see artist in the profession. The only profession that didn't come up actually. So if you are an artist, you wanna define beauty in particularly a different way because of something. So do not get into the sunnah now and do not get into the critical studies now. Purpose, Quran, and formative theories. What is the purpose? 
divide yourself or put yourself under one of these four categories, please. In the methodology that we learned together, we have what we called usuli studies, disciplinary studies, phenomena studies, and strategic studies. Usuli studies have to do with the studies of the Quran and the Sunnah and the sciences that revolve primarily under, around the Quran and the Sunnah. So basically, it would be our brothers and sisters who wrote in their specialization tafsir, hadith, fiqh, da'wah, and so forth. So if you are from the specialization of fiqh, you are under usul studies. So if you are specialized in family law, look at what the Quran is telling you versus what you learned about family law. And you will see a major difference. I deal with family law all the time in fatwa and in courts. And I see a major difference, man. Like the, the basic theories about marriage in family law, what are they? Um, you're talking about the definition of marriage to start with as a, aqd, as a contract. And the way they dealt with that is not the definition of marriage in the Quran. And of course, there is an agreement between the parties involved, but it's not exactly how they defined aqdun ala manfa'a. You know, the contract for exchanging benefits. It's not about that. It, it, it's not how you should define. So if you are from fiqh, revisit. Al-ihtibas, you know, another theory, funny theory, Allah. I don't know where these things come from. That once a woman signs this contract, she is now muhtabasa. She is imprisoned, literally, in her husband's place. And she has to take permission to leave. And if she leaves, uh, then without his permission, then she doesn't have nafaqa. He, he doesn't support her. And if they get divorced, she doesn't get compass. What is this? So basically, if you are from the Usuli studies, you need to look at the Quran versus what you learned from fiqh or hadith or tafsir or da'wah or any of these studies that we call roughly Islamic studies, really. But if you are not in that field, don't bother about this. Of course, family will impact your thought as a political scientist, as an economist, as a businessman. Uh, if you look at business, you cannot just look at tijara, but you also look at family and look at many things. So disciplinary studies, then don't bother with the usuli studies. If you put yourself under one of these, you are really under, where is it? Yeah, here it is. You are under humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, or applied sciences. You're one of those according to our contemporary classification. So basically, uh, are you in politics, psychology, or earth sciences and astronomy, or computer science and health, and so forth? So put yourself under one of those categories, and this is the purpose of define a purpose based on that. What am I trying to do in terms of disciplines? What is my objective? And actually, for, in terms of disciplines, we need to look at how we define the basic concepts of the discipline. Um, basically, how, how do you define language? A couple of you are linguists. How do you define language? A couple of you are historians. You mentioned that your specialization is history. How does the Quran deal with history? That is a very interesting question, actually. I asked myself this question once. I gave a lecture on it. And it's, it's none like the theories of history that you study. Uh, how does the Quran deal with society? It's very different from the th sociological uh, theories and so forth. So disciplinary studies, your purpose is to restructure the way you think about your discipline, is to redefine law. If you are a lawyer, I have a couple of attorneys here. If you are a lawyer, how does law work with the Quran? Think about it, not fiqh. Not necessarily fiqh. And as I mentioned, if you are a professional, we're not asking you to give us fatwa on inheritance or uh, menses or any of that. No, no, this is different. This is people who work in fiqh. But if you are a professional in psychology, forget about fiqh on the side, fiqh that is jurisprudence, and look at the fiqh of psychology and try to develop. If you define yourself, not as in discipline, but as in phenomena, we talked in the course about poverty, social injustice, uh, tyranny, 
We talked about positive phenomena as social movements, as others, like just a phenomena. Um, families, if you want to deal with phenomena away from disciplines, then you are multidisciplinary, you are transdisciplinary. You are looking at the phenomena, wherever it is. If you are specialized in poverty, look at poverty from cover to cover. Where, how does the Quran deal with poverty? And avoid the word searches. Like poverty, do not look for faqr, faqir, fuqara, and that's it. And that's how the Quran deals with faqr. No, of course not. From the beginning to the end, the Quran deals with faqr in many ways. Even if it doesn't mention the word fuqara or the word muluk, hukam uh, in, in political science, or the word uh, imra'a or rajul in, I don't know, women's studies. It doesn't have to be the word nisa' or the word imra'a. There's so much about women without the word nisa' and so much about economy without the word mal or money and so forth. So do not imprison yourself in the linguistic approach and the counting. Uh, the counting is not important. The, the topics are important. Like when you say the Quran mentioned Sharia twice, some people say that, oh, it mentioned Sharia twice or three times, then Sharia is not important. But the, the whole Quran is Sharia. Yeah, you know, what do you mean by Sharia? And so forth. Now, strategic studies is about an organization. And this organization could be a very small NGO and could be a state and could be something that requires strategy. And strategy is wide scope, long term, as you know. We preferred to have this as a separate entity because this has to do with organizations. Uh, these three circles have to do with research and education, with ideas, and this has to do with activism, not necessarily in the civil sense, but even the government sense or an organization that has to do with education, whatever it is. If you are interested in strategy, you have a different approach because your reading of the Quran should be applied. Should um, You should apply it to the strategy you're looking at. Uh, you are looking at strategic management, for example, of an NGO, how do you define the objectives of the NGO? It's through the objectives of the Quran. Don't make the, your objectives of the organization or the movement hijacked by other objectives. You cannot have an Islamic movement that has an objective called, for example, democracy. Even if you support democracy, you can support it as a political movement, but this should not be your objective if you are an Islamic movement, because an Islamic movement has to define its objectives from Islam. And then because we have an objective from Islam that is something, we endorse this part of democracy and we do not endorse this part of democracy, you see? So do not have your objectives hijacked uh, when you are in strategic studies and do not have your worldview hijacked. Sometimes in strategic studies, we define the world in terms of concepts that are not Islamic. So what is a society? It is the, um, um, you know, government officials, you know, public servants and celebrities and politicians and business people and, uh, I don't know, terrorists and civil, server and, and civil society activists and stakeholders and this and that. Yeah, th that is fine. But this should be under a more hegemonic definition of your parties in your strategic studies. You cannot define the parties through somebody else's framework. You should have your own Quranic framework in defining the parties so that when you plan for the future, you're planning for the right parties. Al-Muslihun wal Mufsidun, the reformers and the corruptors for a translation. When you, when you have that, then you are uh, dealing with reform and corruption in a different way versus defining you know groups that have no sultan again so strategic studies now once you place yourself in one of those four areas then your objective will be clearer inshallah I advise you uh, i'm uh, sure dr mahtaz mentioned that we, we sent you through the email this chapter six of the book Re go read that so that you see our general objectives from defining these disciplines so that when you read the Quran, you read them this way.